Dr. Jim Gaines is our chief economist at the Real Estate Center at Texas A&M University. Dr. Gaines focuses on the Texas economy as well as housing and land development issues throughout the state. He has more than 40 years experience in a broad array of professional real estate activities in consulting, research, and education, urban economics, land use analysis, development, and project risk assessment. He is an associate professor of real estate and finance at the University of South Carolina before serving as president of the Rice Center, an urban research center affiliated with Rice University. Dr. Gaines provided extensive real estate consulting services to numerous businesses, financial institutions, developers, and all levels of government organizations during his tenure with Arthur Anderson and KPMG. Let's just say you are smarter than I. <laughs> Please help me welcome a warm welcome with Dr. Jim Gaines. I don't know about the smarter. If I was that smart, I wouldn't be here, right? <laughs> here, here we are, a beautiful day, and you got to sit inside and listen to an economist. I mean, how much boring can it be? Uh, where, are we, where are we? Oh, she, she's still bringing it up. i got to kill some time. I do appreciate the opportunity to come. I, I think we've, this is second or third or fourth year that we've done this, and, and in this facility. I think we've done it in other facilities and and so forth in years past. And it's always interesting because uh, it's an economic outlook. It's a forecast luncheon, right? That was the operative word that got everybody's attention, that I'm supposed to tell you what the future is going to look like. I'm an economist. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, but I'm not going to tell you when. <laughs> That's up to you, okay? So, so you have to you have to bear with me, and and uh, we'll see what's going on. I, I thought though, uh, I hope all of you are also incidentally. Before I forget, I got to get a commercial in. You got sponsors. I got to get a commercial in. Otherwise, I I'm in trouble. With my boss, the Real Estate Center at Texas A&M. We are doing more and better things because of our affiliation with. ABOR and with other groups around the state and with TAR, of course, in the data relevance program that started a couple of three years ago, we're, we're looking at data now that we've never been able to look at before and in ways that we've never been able to do it before, geographically, spatially. We're, we're, we're doing some really, really neat stuff. So I'm going to tell you, in the next year or so, you're going to start seeing, we, most of you are familiar, you hear the Case Schiller price index that comes out monthly, whatever. Starting, where are we, June? In August, we got a Texas housing price index. And it'll be, and we'll have it for each major metropolitan area. So there'll be an Austin house price. We're, those are the kind of things we're able to do with repeat sales, not just how the median price has changed, but, but looking at the same house selling different times and computing the rate of change on that on that price. It, it holds a quality quality issue. Now, that's not universally true because if it's seven years since the last sale, something could have happened with that house, right? So, so we have a way of monitoring that because we're getting all the tax assessment data. Assuming you're honest and tell the tax assessor when you build the pool, you know, in the backyard. Uh, and you all do that, of course. All, all of your clients do that. But, but if we can do that, those are the kinds of things that heretofore we have not been able to do that we are going to be presenting and bringing out and bringing to market in, in our research efforts to provide better information uh, to the boards and so forth. But let me, let me, we're going to start, in, and this is, I'm going to, in my typical fashion, I, I'm going to start from the very, very broad generalizations and then try to get it down more specifically uh, to the central Texas area, the Austin metropolitan area, uh, however we're going to refer to it. But, but I thought I'd start at a highbrow level. Newton's law of motion and inertia. I'm sure you're all real familiar with it. Uh, but, but the first law is that an object at rest stays at rest. And I are the perfect example of that. Uh, couch potato come to mind. You know, g get me in front of a football game and on TV, I'm at rest and just don't bother me because I ain't moving. So an object at rest stays at rest. But uh, Noon's law of motion, and here I'll bring in the relevance. An object in motion tends to stay in motion until or unless something affects it to either stop it, slow it down, or deflect it into a different direction. 
And the, the relevance of that here to this discussion is that that's the, our economy. Our economy has been doing that. Uh, particularly the national economy, the state of Texas economy, and the economy here locally. It's been in motion, and, and it's built momentum. Now, the, uh, the national economy, quite frankly, we're in what? The, uh, it's been, are you aware that it's more than 11 years now since the recession of 07, 08 started? Wow. No. Yeah. It started in December 07. It officially ended uh, June 08. Uh, uh, <laughs> a decade. And what we've had is we've had the, the growth in the national economy recovering from the Great Recession, but it's been just modest. Uh, average rate of growth since World War II, U.S. economy, give you some numbers, 3.4% a year. We're never at average, but that's what it averages out because it's always up and down and, you know, it goes in cycles. But the average is about 3.4. But the last nine years now, almost 10 years, we're averaging about 2.2. Okay? Well, that doesn't, that sounds pretty good, but 2.2 is a full percentage point or more less than our long-term average. And, and so it's been, yeah. That's a technical economics term. <laughs> that means it's just been very modest, very, you know, just sort of. But, but quite frankly, that the good news has been it's been growing. It has been positive. It's been moving up, and and uh, attendant factors like inflation has been virtually nil. Okay, uh, interest rates. Did anybody in this room, especially with this color hair? Ever think you'd be able to buy a house with an interest rate under 6%? Under 5%? Under 4%? Nuts. I mean, absolute nuts. You, you just, you, it just, it was, wasn't, you couldn't even dream it. You couldn't even imagine it. But yet that's where we've been. Okay? And, and we've got now a whole generation coming up. We call them millennials. The best excuse going to understand why some species eat their young? <laughs> but the millennials, I, you know, I, I, I shouldn't say that. I went to college in the 60s. I can't imagine what my parents were thinking about us. <laughs> if we think the millennials are bad, ah. I think, of course, I read lately that, that the, the, the psychologists are saying that the only reason the, uh, the greatest generation, the World War II generation, were so down on the baby boomers, they got jealous because they missed all the free love. It, it was. <laughs> See, the millennials got nothing on the boomers. But anyway. The, so it's coming. So we're seeing this. We're seeing this economy. We're seeing the movement. The momentum has came, come, come along, and it's moving along. And it's happening here as well. What's been happening here in central Texas, the Austin metropolitan area? This area has just been booming. I mean, you heard Steve talk about it's one of the top three in the country in terms of rate of growth and all of the kinds of measures that are going on in population, in, in uh, employment, economic activity, and that momentum is still going, and it's still going strong. And it, it probably isn't over, but it will slow down eventually. <laughs> I told you, I'd tell you what, but not when, okay? But it, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It, it's doing, and, and we're basically what I'm here to tell you, and I'm, I'm giving you the answer to the whole presentation, so you can go back to sleep here in a second. Uh, the, 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 the economy is doing well, and, and for the next couple of years at least, maybe you know, the year or two, it's, it's going to be good. I mean, 2019, we're already starting to think 2019. You know, we're halfway through 18. Well, my job is to stay, think further out. And, and 2019, it looks like the same momentum that's come through 17, 18 is going to go right on into 19, unless something major happens that we don't see. Okay, and I'm telling you right now, I don't see major headwinds or major issues on the horizon that are likely to put up much of a barrier. Now, that doesn't mean everything's going to go hunky-dory and going to be real smooth and there won't be issues. Uh, uh, there will be. 
But we don't see anything that, that, that big thing, big issue, big headwind that's going to slow it down. 2020 gets fuzzy. Uh, and, and, and fuzzy is the best word I can come up with. Uh, among other things, it's an election year. It's presidential election year. Holy moly. If you think back on the last one and then try to think of the next one, uh, this could be a lot of fun. And, and, and have no idea, you know, who or what is going to come out of the woodwork uh, to run. Because I'll guarantee you, two years before the last election, did anybody even think Trump was going to be anything? No, I mean, he wasn't even on the discussion list, okay? And then all of a sudden it happened. So the world is changing, and it's changing fast. That's the other thing that's going on. I, I did have a chance to do a presentation here about a month ago up in Dallas with a futurist. Oh, that was interesting. Okay, so we were looking at all the technology and, and so forth, and, and you're seeing it in your industry. I'm, I'm rambling here. Yeah, I didn't gotten to my good slides. I'm a economist. You're going to see charts and graphs. You know it's coming. <laughs> but but uh, think about your business. Think about how you're doing your business. Anybody here not have a cell phone? No. Everybody's got one. And your cell phone is probably smarter than you are. I mean, Steve was talking about being smart. That's smarter than you. It, it's more powerful than the average computer was 10 years ago. That, that little thing you're carrying around in your pocket. Okay? It can do remarkable things. And it gives you access to information, data, uh, what have you, for your business, for your personal life. And then, and then you can put by minute by minute, you know, what you're doing, and every time you sneeze and put it on Facebook and everybody can watch you sneeze. <laughs> I'm too old for that stuff. But anyway, the, the whole point is it's, it, the whole world is changing, and that momentum is going through. So the, probably the best news I've got for you today is the good times are here, <laughs> and, and they're still continuing here for at least a while, Okay. Now, does that mean you, you're, you're well aware you're all over 21, aren't you? Um, you know, the, the, the world works in cycles and goes up and down. But, but right now we're on an up cycle here in the central Texas area. And the state is, incidentally. The whole state is. Uh, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth and Austin are the, the, the shining lights uh, of, of Texas right now in terms of all of the stuff going on. I know. I'm going to get to it. Uh, uh, but, but San Antonio has done remarkably well because we always think of San Antonio as being that slow, steady, right? Nothing high, nothing low, just keep on going. Boy, it's been a hot market too. It's been a great market. And even Houston, but Houston has more of the volatility, uh, with the oil and gas and so forth. Uh, it's, you know, you can have access to all the slides. So don't worry about taking pictures of slides and stuff, and, and I'll make them available or, or, or through ABOR, you, you'll have access to all the slides. But the U.S. Ac uh, economy, the, we had to, something called the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Only a politician could put tax cuts and jobs in the same title <laughs> of a bill, but they did. But, but it's been uncertain. The expectation was, of course, that we were going to lower taxes on co companies, corporations, uh, help individuals, uh, lower, give more disposable income to people. Uh, and yeah, the withholdings have, have dropped, okay? People have more net money uh, on, their, on their monthly paycheck. Uh, corporations pay, and what the expectation was, corporations would take that money and invest it. People would take their savings and go spend it. OK, uh, and and that we would get these economic that hadn't shown up yet. I, I got to tell you, on the statistics, the national statistics hadn't shown up yet. It, it's just sort of beginning to. But but after all, it's only been six months because it started January. Uh, it, it'll be next year before for companies, for example, when they file their income tax returns for this year, for next year, you know, that they'll really start seeing it. And individuals the same way. Uh, we don't react quite that fast. The last time we had a major tax cut and, and tax uh, savings, uh, the, the statistics were that almost 60 or 70 percent of the savings that, quote unquote, the tax savings got uh, uh, saved, invested or repaid debt. It didn't get spent. The idea is to spend it because that's GDP. That's spending. That means the economy's growing. But if you just pay back debt 
or you save the money and put it in the bank or invest it in your IRA or, or whatever, that, that doesn't show up in the, in the GDP statistics. You with me on that? That's how economists lie to you, to tell you things are really going great when they're not, or they're not when they are. We're really good at that. Uh, slow GDP growth, that's what I was talking about. Now, the good news is, at the national level, U.S. level, the, 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 and this is always nervous when you have a consensus of economists thinking the same thing. It generally means they're wrong. Uh, the, the thought is that instead of 2.2 or 2.3 percent, it's going to be between two and a half and three percent. Three percent was always the magic number. Could we get back to a three percent growth rate? May not get there. May get there on a quarterly basis, but for the whole year might have a little trouble. But we'll have to see. But it's going to be a very big, good year. Interest rates. I gave you this projection last year. I'll give it to you again and I'll explain why I was wrong. My projection on interest rates, interest rates will change. <laughs> but I'm only 50% sure of that. Because I made that prediction last year and I was wrong. They didn't change. It was interesting. I mean, they had some variability during the year. But if, for those of you in the market, you were, you were busy in your businesses. But think about it. Last January, somebody buying a house, what mortgage interest rate did it get? Somebody buying a house December of that of last year, what mortgage interest rate they get? I'll bet you it wasn't more than about a tenth of a point difference. So basically, the interest rates, the mortgage interest rates, didn't change much last year. So I was wrong. Interest rates didn't change. So that's the reason I got maybe. <laughs> I'm not stupid. <laughs> get. I'll, I'll put up there that they're likely to rise. And they are likely to rise. Maybe. <laughs> now, I think, I, I think, well, I got, I, I got a graph for you in a minute. Uh, that, here's the thing that's going on. And the reason why I think interest rates will go up this year, national, global, and this is not national, this is not just state, this is global. Global debt demand, the demand for debt, for capital, for money, okay, to go borrow it is, is on, on, on the steep increase. And there's only so much capital out there. Well, all of you remember Economics 101, right? Demand goes up, supply stays same, what do prices do? They go up, okay? Interest rate, just the price of money. It's just the price you pay to rent some money. It's, it's rent. Just like you rent a house or you rent an apartment. It's just renting the money. You get to use it for a while, but you got to give it back. And in the meantime, you got to pay a monthly fee. That's the interest rate or the rent on the money. Well, it's the same thing, supply and demand, and that global debt is increasing, national debt is increasing. Our U.S. government this year, our U.S. government's going to borrow almost a trillion dollars. Because they're spending almost a trillion dollars more than what they bring in in revenue. Basically, in about the next three years, as I understand it, the U.S. government will be at break even on tax revenues and total revenues with mandatory expenditures, entitlement programs, and defense, and debt service. You know a thing about debt service. You know what that means, right? That's one reason the government's so nervous about interest rates going up. If you were in hock for $20 trillion, you'd be nervous about an eighth of a point or a quarter of a point or a half of a point increase in the interest rate. That's a lot of money. I could almost retire. <laughs> almost. You know, I'd take a half a percent on $20 trillion, wouldn't you? Yeah. Okay, so we have to watch that. Inflation is going up. We've had very modest to literally no inflation. Uh, real, real rates of return uh, of, of exceptionally uh, amount uh, in, in lately because inflation has been so low. Well, now the wages are, and, and salaries are beginning to come up a little bit. They're buoying up a little bit. Labor is short. Are you aware that last month the, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported there were more job openings than there are unemployed people? Yeah. 6.3 million jobs versus 6.1 million people that are technically unemployed. Now, their classification of being unemployed means you're looking for work. Okay, your brother-in-law doesn't count. 
If he isn't looking for work, he, he's not considered unemployed by government statistics. Okay. But, 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 uh, it's, it's interesting. So income is growing. <clears throat> the spending, as I've mentioned, hasn't picked up yet, but we're seeing this kind of thing. Now, housing at the national level, if you're not aware of it, housing market has not recovered from the 0708 recession. When, when economists talk about the housing market, they're talking about new home construction. New home construction. In, in terms of the number of units and total dollars invested, because that's new. It's net new into the economy of new, something new being spent money on, and all the appliances and the carpet and the lumber and all of the other stuff, and the jobs being created. So, but the housing has not fully recovered. We're running about 85% of our long-term norm of building houses in the United States. Now, that's not true in Texas, and I'll show you the numbers. And that's one of the things that's different about Texas, this, you know, and why we've been the leading state. But we'll see. Jobs are expanding about one and one and a half percent. The unemployment rate is less than four percent. Uh, the unemployment rate, as it's reported, is a little misleading. Uh, in fact, it's a lot misleading. Um, uh, the way they count it. Like I said, if you're unemployed but not looking for work, uh, you're not considered unemployed. So it doesn't count on the, um, on the unemployment rate. You with me? Okay, okay. I told you, economists know how to lie with statistics. We're past masters at, at, at doing this kind of stuff. Okay, interest rates. <laughs> the rate you hear the most about the federal fund rate every time the Federal Reserve meets and they're going to do something with the federal, that's that green line across the bottom. And you can see how it was just uh, uh, barely above zero for so long. Uh, technically, the, the target range was zero to 0.25%. So it's not exactly on the zero line, it's on the 0.25% line. But it's been going up. It just recently hit 2% as their target. The blue line in the middle is the 10-year Treasury rate. That one's the one that really you should pay the most attention to if you're going to try and look at mortgage interest rates. Because mortgage interest rates tend to be tied to the 10-year Treasury, not to the federal funds uh, overnight bank lending rate, which is the, the Fed funds rate. Uh, and, and the spread is about 1.7. You can, you can, you can, within a, a tenth of a point or two tenths of a percentage, a, a percentage point, figure out if, and, and so for example, the current, uh, 10 year treasury rate is around three, right at about three. So where should the 30 year fixed mortgage rate be? Should be around 4.7. It's actually running about four and a half, I think. Four, 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 five, somewhere in that kind of bracket. I know it's all different. It'll depend on which lender you're talking to on which day and which hour of that day. It's like trying to buy an airplane ticket. You have no idea what they cost. You don't know what the interest rate's going to be until you actually get somebody on the phone and make them make a commitment. And then you got to get them to sign and, 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 hold, and commit to it, right? And even then it can change again, right? Okay, so, so I'm, I'm going to use generalizations for interest rates, but that's what the, the national uh, reported rate from Freddie Mac is. And the, the point is, though, you can see that black line, which is that 30-year fixed mortgage rate, it is trending upward. And you can see how in the last year or so, um, actually this year, it's mostly the last uh, eight months, uh, how it has jumped up about a half, uh, half a percentage point, about 50 to 65 basis points. Uh, in terms of where it is. Here's what we're thinking is going to happen. This is the mortgage interest rate. I, one of the things I like to point out to people, particularly the millennials, <clears throat> between January 03 and January 07, we had something called a housing boom in the, in the United States, right? I, I mean, it was a boom. People buying houses, I mean, all you had to do is walk into a lender's office and fog a mirror and you got a loan. And it was a debate about fogging the mirror. And, and uh, but did you know that the average interest rate during that period of time was 6%? Okay, because I get asked the question so often, well, what's it going to do to the housing market if we go back up, if we go back up to 5%? And my answer is, I ain't going to do much about anything. Uh, to be perfectly blunt about it, there'll be your, your customers, your buyers, there'll be some right on that edge, right? We're going from four and a half to five or five and a quarter is going to make a difference. And, and you always have those clients. You always have those customers. But then you'll have the majority of your customers. It really, yeah, it's another 20, 30, 40, 50 bucks a month. And it's a, so what? 
I want to buy that house. Here's what I'm going to do. And if I got to pay 5% instead of four and three eighths or four and a half, so be it. Uh, so quite frankly, not sure it's going to make much difference. You can see the two jumps there. The interest rates have been trending downward. They've been trending down long term trend. I mean, you have the ups and downs, but the long term trend has been downward basically since 1980. Anybody remember 1980? Try 15 to 18% mortgage rates. Yeah. If you've got a young person in your family, have they asked you, Mom how, or Dad, how did you ever buy a house with 15% mortgage money? Well, you just did. Or you didn't. <laughs> More likely, you didn't. But, but you just did. So it's interesting. We, are, we were anticipating rates would go up anywhere from 25 to 100 basis points. A 100 basis point increase would put it pretty close to five. If that 10-year treasury is at three, then I'm a 4.7 makes a lot of sense. That 1.7 spread, yeah, I, you, you, you can know that one by the end of the morning. You, you can dazzle all of your friends at the next cocktail conversation. Oh yeah, well the 10 years are three, so I think mortgage rates be about four seven. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, and it works. It works. It, it, it's it's more or less true. Uh, and I, what I did is I, I, I graphed on here, the black line is the continuation, because I made that projection in January. So I wanted to see how I did and what I was projecting for interest rates with what they really did. Okay, so that's where you can see the black line is a lot steeper than my projection lines. Those, those are just straight lines from where it was January to December. So it's interesting. <laughs> we'll have to see how it works out. And here's what I was talking about for Texas. 2017 was a recovery year. Uh, as you well know, at the state level, the state's economy slipped considerably. Uh, during 15 and 16, when the price of oil fell, uh, GDP for the state for 2016 went down to about 0.4%. Uh, I mean, it was just above zero. It didn't go into negative, which was a real nervous time. I don't know if you're aware of it. But the, but the amount of decline, the percentage decline in the price of oil and the rig count, rig count's the other thing that's important, the decline in those two things in 2015, percentage-wise, was bigger than the decline that we faced back in 1982 and 3. And you remember what happened in 19, for some of you, you remember what happened in the, in the second half of the 80s and what a, it was a depression. Texas suffered an economic depression. It wasn't a recession, it was a depression, uh, but it was just localized. Well, there was nervousness that if we had that kind of decline again here in Texas, would we have that repeat kind of uh, thing happen? And the good news is, no, it didn't happen. We are a much more resilient, economically resilient state today than we were back in the 80s, okay? One of the reasons was Austin and the Austin area. The high tech moving in. Austin is not particularly tied strongly, if at all, to the oil and gas industry. Your, your fortunes in the central Texas area generally don't rise and fall with the, with the oil and gas industry. And J.R. Ewing notwithstanding, neither does Dallas and Fort Worth. You don't believe, you don't understand, around the world, the rest of the world thinks Dallas-Fort Worth is an oil and gas town because of that damn TV show. <laughs> for no other reason, for no other reason except that that was where it was, that it was situated. Of course, we all know in Texas that's not true. Dallas-Fort Worth, I can tell you, correlates to the national economy at 0.93. Austin uh, uh, correlates at about 0.89, 0.9. It's a little less because of the high-tech and government uh, influence, okay? So the, the correlation to the total national economy in terms of distribution of jobs and economic activity and ba economic base and all that stuff, it's, it's, the correlation's a little bit less. Houston only correlates at like 0 0.74, 0 0.75 because of its reliance on the energy and gas, energy and oil. You with me on that? I mean, the good news for Texas is it's like diversification in a portfolio. We've got four, we got five major metropolitan areas, if you count Fort Worth and Dallas separately. We got more than that. I mean, we got 25 MSAs, but those are the five biggies. And they're diversified. <laughs> Their economies are diversified. So when one's up, the other ones don't necessarily, or down, when one's down, the other ones don't necessarily have to be in the same way. So it keeps it, the state 
uh, a little bit better off. So we're seeing 2018, 2017 was recovery. 2018 is better. 2019, that's that momentum. I was, that's the reason I put the first slide up there. I think the momentum from 17 and 18 is going to carry us right on in through 19 unless something major happens. Remember the, the highlighted words, unless something happens to make it change, to change either the direction or the, the rate of, of motion. And that was Newton's law. And, and the economy is kind of the same way. It'll keep right on going. And, and of course, a state, the state of uh, Texas is a big economy. It's massive. It's second only to California in terms of size among the states uh, in the union. Um, uh, our, our energy is, is, is terrific. I mean, when we become independent, Texas will be the sixth largest producer of oil and gas in the world. I mean, that gets your attention. So when I tell you that our state's economy has some reliance on oil and gas, you, you got you to gotta feel for it now. We're equal to Canada. We're, we're as big as Canada. Just the state of Texas in oil production. So, so it's, it's, it's really, and we're increasing. We're, you know, we're going up. The fracking, the fracturing... They don't like fracking in the industry. Fracturing uh, is is added to the production capacity to the point where it's really terrific. So 2019 looks pretty good. I got a bunch of question marks, but I think it's pretty good. 2020, who knows? Uh, I thought you'd like to see my crystal ball. Hey, you know, we're doing a forecast, right? I just thought you'd like to see what my crystal ball looks like. <laughs> I consult it often. You think I'm joking. I've got one of those sitting on my desk. My wife gave it to me. <laughs> she, she knew. All right. Our economic outlook in, in Texas for the state employment, we're probably going to go up 3 or 4%. Uh, we watch all of the projections, of course. Dallas Fed, uh, Keith Phillips up there does a good job with that. He's saying 3, 3, 3, 4. Uh, I was saying 3, 6, 3, 7 here earlier. Uh, but it's somewhere between 3 and 4%, which is up considerably from last year. I'll show you the graph in a minute. GDP will probably go up to about 4.1%. We're going to, uh, ironically, a lot of the recovery from Hurricane Harvey uh, along on the coastal area is going to add almost a half a point to our GDP in the state this year because that's money that gets spent on repair, remodel, you know, labor, materials, and so forth. So we'll we'll see that. The, the energy sector downturn that we experienced in 15 and 16 is over. All of the negative impacts, and as a matter of fact, it's reversed. Uh, I can tell you that mining and logging as an industry segment was the biggest gainer in last year, and it continues to be percentage-wise the biggest gainer in jobs this year. Uh, so we're seeing that. Uh, our, most of my forecast that I'm giving you today we were basing it on our modeling at uh, oil prices being stable between 55 and 60. And right now, as most of you are aware, it's, it's a lot higher than that. It's been uh, really probably we could have looked at between 60 and 70. And that's a big range. I mean, that's a $10 spread in there. But, but uh, it's that. Population is still growing. Boy, are we growing. Right? I mean, you can't get around. I, I'm going to, I got a lot of good news. I do have a couple of bad news. One is cars and trucks. And trying to get from here to there within the next hour. That, that, that becomes, which leads us to local growth issues, which I believe, uh, where Texas is entering that period. We, we, we've been a prosperous state for a number of good reasons, natural resources and people and so forth. But one of the things Texas has been notorious for is, is more or less of what, what used to be called laissez-faire uh, government. It was a very relaxed regulatory government oversight uh, from state to counties to cities, name it. Well, that's changing. You, you think Austin is aware of that? or the people are aware of Austin. Trust me, the, the city council in College Station wants to be weird too. <laughs> and it, 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 but, but, and it, but it's inevitable when you have the kind of population growth we have 
and, and are having, have had, and are having it here in the state. The public sector can't keep pace. It just can't. Uh, when all this new development happens and, yeah, there's going to be higher tax revenues and so forth, yeah, but it's a two-year lag and maybe more uh, between the time it happens and the demand for services is created and the revenues are actually generated to help pay for it. And, and people get concerned about how it grows, where it grows, what the regs are, what the building codes are, height restrictions, you name it. And, of course, now what's one of the fundamental housing issues for realtors, you know this, affordability. Have you heard that word here in Austin lately? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, we were helping ABOR here a few months ago put some uh, data together on Austin affordability. And so all of these things are becoming pressing and pressing and pressing. One of the more depressing things I can tell you is that if you want to know what Texas is going to look like in 30 years, 40 years, Look at California today. Tell me what's different. Tell me we're not going down the same road in terms of population growth, the housing issues, the, the public services issues, water. L.A. was dead. L.A. was absolutely dead meat in the 1920s. They didn't have any water in the L.A. basin. That was when Mulholland went up and stole water. I mean, uh, negotiated to get water from upstate and, and pipe it in. That was who Mulholland was. On Mulholland Drive, that, you know, no, never mind. Okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're facing some of those same issues, uh, particularly transportation, education, taxes, property taxes. What did California do with property taxes? Prop 13, back in 78, 79. Okay. Uh, and, and, it's been a problem ever since for them. Uh, around here in Central Texas, my guess is that we have to build in the Central Texas area somewhere two or three elementary schools every year because of the population growth. I think there's been almost one high school a year somewhere in the area, in the multi-county area, opening up. Those are expensive, and that's just the capital cost of building them. The operating costs are even worse because you've got to hire the teachers and the groundskeepers and maintenance and all the supplies and all the equipment and, you know, you name it. So so the school districts are just beside themselves. I can't figure out how to do it either. They don't know. How have schools always been funded? Property tax. Is that going to change? Not likely. <laughs> the answer is no. He's, he's probably right. It, not in the short run. And 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 I'm not sure. I don't. I mean, I wish I had a magic pill answer for you. I got one, but no a politician in Texas will live with it. And and quite frankly, it's debatable whether it's the right answer because it, a lot of other states do the same thing, and they're not a whole lot better off. Okay. The whole idea that you institute another tax to help defray the cost of this tax. Politicians don't generally go let it go down, so that that it doesn't always help. Rebound from Harvey, yeah, that's going on. It uh, has New Orleans <laughs> completely come back. What makes you think the coastal area of Texas is going to come back? We'll come back a little faster because we're we're much more aggressive. We are much more aggressive. It was spread out over a bigger area. Uh, uh, I can tell you, Houston's going through a major issue down there uh, with new MUDs being created. MUDs are critical over in the Houston area because they don't have the utilities and services. But now the city uh, and the county both uh, instituted regulations that houses have to be built two feet above the 500-year floodplain. And, of course, they can't agree where the 500-year floodplain is, and they can't agree how high two feet above it is. So, so, but that's the kind of thing that it, it's like coastal area. What happened after uh, Ike, if you recall, they raised it from 11 feet to 13 feet. I mean, go on coastal area, you always see the houses up on uh, pillars, right? And you think, well, okay, that makes sense. Get floods, put it underneath. Well, that's where Houston is going to be and some of the other coastal areas and towns. Well, it takes a lot of money to raise a, a slab on grade house, which they're doing. Houses are literally being picked up and put on stilts or on beams. It, yeah, in Houston, in Meyerland and other areas. It's about 80 bucks a square foot. 
Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, energy. We were talking about how important energy is. The dark line up there is the, the rig count, uh, and what you can see is the decline in the rigs that started in 2014 along and, and was preceded by uh, the price line, which is the price of West Texas Intermediate. That's that uh, uh, orange-colored line there. That was a maroon line until it started going down. I changed the color. No, I didn't, but it makes a great story. <laughs> but you can see how it bottomed out in May of, of uh, 16, both in the rig count and the price. The price leads, of course, if the price goes down, then the rig count comes down. And if, when the prices finally go back up, then the rig count goes back up. Uh, the, the main thing that's happened, of course, is that the technology within the fracking and fracturing uh, process has increased magnitudes. And so, uh, for example, that was a new industry in 2008, 9, 10, 11. You know, going out and, and drilling vertically or, you know, straight down and then horizontally and then fracturing the, the shale and so forth. That was, the, the technology, the knowledge was there, but they hadn't done it. They didn't have a whole lot of experience with it. So it was relatively new. And, and, and in those early days, 9, 10, and 11, the average production of a new well was 20, 30, 40 do, uh, barrels a day, okay? Today, they're drilling wells. They're going down about a mile and a half. They're going out about two miles, and the productivity is somewhere around 1,400, 1,500, 1,700 barrels a day. So the, the simple, obvious thing there is you just don't need as many wells, okay? And what they do is they put the, the rigs... On a, on, a, on a rail line. And they go in and they drill this well and go out. And then when that one's done, they move it over 10 feet and go do another one. And then when that one's done, they go over and move it 10 feet and do another one. You with me? So they don't have to do the rigs. They don't have to take them down, put them back up. So the rig count doesn't come. Well, the rig count's always been critical. That's where a lot of the employment was. It was labor. A lot of labor and, and all the services, the, the Halliburtons and the Baker Hughes folks and Schlumbergers of the world and so on. And then a whole bunch of little guys that, that provided all the services. So all of that has changed with changes in the industry. But the overall view is the price of oil has come back up. Uh, the Saudis are, have said lately they would like it to come back up to 80 bucks a barrel. Uh, Putin over in Russia. Russia is still the number one producing country in the world, but just barely. U.S. is now number two. We're bigger than Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Okay, we're now number two, and it's real close on daily production. Uh, within the next couple of three years, we'll probably be bigger than Russia. We'll be number one. <laughs> we'll be number one again. Okay, uh, it's it. Uh, Putin needs it. He, he's going broke. The Saudis, the Saudi royal family's going broke. Uh, they need higher prices. They're going to try and control production. At least that's what they claim they're going to do. Uh, Putin's only got three products to sell for Russia. Okay, uh, he's got oil and gas, and 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 they're a major productive number one. They sell a lot of oil and gas, but their facilities are older. They're conventional wells, not the horizontal fracturing. Uh, their technology is not quite as that. If you want to know about espionage, that's where the real espionage is going on, is in the in industrial espionage sector, particularly on energy production and so forth. But his, his market for uh, oil and gas is, is being shrunk. We are now exporting oil. We are now exporting uh, liquid nat natural gas, LNG, to the rest of the world. So we're now producing and selling to some of uh, Putin's client, so he's got a problem. He only had three products. He had oil and gas, he had vodka, and Texas is trying to take that market too. <laughs> Thank you very much. But his biggest market is weapons. Where he's really been making money is selling weapons. Why do you think we keep having people shooting at each other all over the Middle East? and so forth. Putin needs to sell weapons. He needs people to keep shooting at each other. So you get that. Anyway, oil and gas, the energy market for Texas is looking good. 
Uh, prices are up. Rig count is up. Rig count probably will never go back up to those record levels that you see at the top of the graph. Simply don't need that many wells and that many rigs in the first place. But it'll be an active market. It, the technology is coming, though, just like in all industries. Uh, uh, it's being roboticized. Is there such a word? Yeah. Is roboticized? I'm not even sure. Don't ask me to spell it. Roboticated. Roboticated. I like that better. Uh, but uh, uh, using more uh, robotics and so forth. So, again, the employment may be different. Annual jobs, this is what it looks like. You can see how we've been going up. Uh, I've, in, I've included a 3.3% growth rate for this year, which would equate to a little over 400,000 jobs being added in Texas. Quite frankly, that's a conservative estimate relative to what a lot of other prognosticators are, are telling us. Uh, I mean, everybody's all guesswork. Uh, so take your pick. If it was about three and a half percent, if we could increase it from three three to three and a half, it would add about another forty thousand jobs. I mean, we're a big enough economy that, that a half a point difference on the growth rate, you know, equates to thirty, forty, fifty thousand jobs. So we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, we'll do pretty good. Uh, I just hit the wrong button. There we go. Here's what, here's what we're looking at across the board for the major MSAs in Texas, and here's the good news for Austin. The green bar there, we're looking at about 3.7% growth in employment here in the Austin area. That's just phenomenal. That's really good. I mean, 17 was good at 3.3, but we think it'll be a little bit better than that. You can see that followed by Dallas-Fort Worth. El Paso is going to grow. Houston's going all right. San Antonio is doing very, very well. And the state at large, about uh, 3%, 3.3% uh, for the state at large. So it kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking at uh, for this year for Austin. I mean, it's more of the same. Isn't that what I told you to start off with? I told you I was giving you the answer first. And let's talk about Austin. Uh, if you hadn't watched, seen this before, this is the business cycle index that's put out by the Dallas Fed. This is an index that they develop to look at general business activity in a market area in the state, and they do it for most of the me metropolitan areas. And so you can just see how Austin is just off the chart almost compared to the state at large. I can tell you that Dallas-Fort Worth, Houston, and San Antonio, their lines more or less are right on top of that Texas line. They just, if, if I had to put them all together, you wouldn't have been even able to discern those other lines because they'd all just blended together right along the Texas line. But Austin has just been extremely good. And the good news, or a, a part of the good news is, as you can see, uh, at least this side of the room can see, uh, <laughs> that, that that tail over here, over here, that the steepness of that increase. I mean, that, that's, that's what really gets your attention, not just the absolute level, but the, the rate of increase, the way that line has been going up and, and so forth, that our economic activity is going up. Retail sales, it's been interesting last year or so, at least it looks like that they've sort of uh, uh, leveled off a little bit. Uh, uh, we'll have to see what's going on. It's interesting. I know the retail market here is very, very tight. Uh, uh, occupancy levels are very high. Vacancy rate in retail property, for those of you who deal in the commercial side of things, and I don't know how many of you are more, you're, I'm guessing most of you are residential, but I'm sure some of you dabble with the commercial. But the retail has been very, very good. I'll try to remember to hold this up. Uh, the retail has been very tight and, and so on. Uh, retail sales probably are being limited because they're just not that much Local act, and this is from the controller's office, so it's what they're getting sales tax revenue from, which may or may not include some of the internet sales. So, so you, you always wonder about that. Annual jobs, you can see how uh, Austin has gone up again at 3.7 percent growth. I'm sure you can all read those numbers; they're so big and so easy to discern. It, it's over a million jobs. We got, went over a million jobs in the Austin area last year. And it's going to be up over almost 1.1 million. But look at those rates of growth there in the red box, 4338-3237. When you have rate of growth in jobs in an economy the size of Austin, generally you don't see those kind of percentage rate increases except for uh, metropolitan areas of like less than 500,000, where uh, 10 or 15,000 jobs make a big percentage jump. 
Okay, that's that's what's impressive here. Uh, looking at these things, rate of growth in Austin, you can see how it's just been going and blowing for quite some time. Yeah, it took a dip back in 09. I mean, after all, the rest of the world, the rest of the country, the state was getting recession. Okay, we'll have one too. Uh, but we didn't go nearly as deep down and we came back up a lot faster, particularly relative to the U.S. And Austin has just been going and blowing ever since. And it, 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 it's, it's in the hill. I mean, it's like you can see and, and tell, uh, the good news. All right. Let me talk about people. <laughs> uh, Texas keeps getting bigger. Everything's bigger in Texas, right? Well, the population's getting bigger too. Um, 2017. Here's kind of what it looks like by county. Uh, I-35, I know you're familiar with I-35 River that, that's out here that's, that's uh, uh, loaded up with barges so you can't get across or up or down it, right? Okay. 87% uh, of the people in Texas live along the I-35 corridor or east. Okay. I mean, we have our Texas megalopolis, uh, which is the I-35, I-45, I-10 triangle that links uh, San Antonio, Austin, up to Dallas, Fort Worth, back down to Houston, and then back across east-west on I-10. And if you that triangle is is our urban triangle of Texas. And I was talking about that earlier. Now, yeah, we've got McAllen down there on the border. We've got El Paso out there. You, you can see Lubbock and Amarillo, uh, uh, Midland, Odessa. Uh, if you're not aware of it, the boom towns right now in Texas are Midland and Odessa. I mean, that doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but, but they are. They, they, but that's because they went down and now they back, back up again. So, so it's, it's really going on out there. But, but, uh, you can see, incidentally, you can see how at the county level it's filling in up and down the I-35 corridor. Uh, a lot of you probably remember Henry Cisneros when he was mayor down in San Antonio. And he always talked about the Austin San Antonio high tech corridor and so on. He was just 25 years ahead of his time. It's true. It was there. It's just taken 25 or 30 years to get here, okay, or to, to really start filling in. But go up and down I-35 from San Antonio to Waco, and it's commercial almost the whole way up, right? I mean, you just don't see the open spaces that you used to see a few years ago uh, up and down the highway. And it's, it's going to get that way. And now, of course, it's spreading out even a little bit east and west. Everybody wants to go west, but it's being forced east because of land cost and land prices. Uh, uh, 2010 to 2017, the change in population by county. I love these heat maps because it kind of gives you an idea of what's going on around the state. The, the high growth counties, no, no, no surprise. You, you, I mean, you'd have told me that intuitively. There it is, <laughs> graphically. And you can see where it's, you know, the Dallas Fort Worth area, the four counties up there, the central. But look at the counties around them. Look at the counties around, uh, Travis County and Williamson County. Uh, again, east and west, uh, going, but Bayer and, and on down to Kamal and Hayes County. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the, the growth in there. But incidentally, during that period of time, 97 counties lost population in Texas. The, the white ones, See them out there? I mean, there's no reason to be out there anyway, but. <laughs> Let me explain. If you're 28, 29 years old, and you're not running the family business or the family farm, out in that, what do you do? You leave. And, and incidentally, if I gave you the heat map of where the concentration of over 55 are, it, it looks just like that. They're all in those white counties because all the young people left or are leaving. And I mean, they start leaving at 18, you know, uh, get out of high school. And a lot of them, if they can, they go get either get a job or they go to college or whatever. But they generally leave and go somewhere else. And it's just the, the nature of the beast uh, in some of these areas. Incidentally, those are some of the most severe water shortage areas. And their agriculture is, but you can see the, the growth, uh, that's happening around T one year, 2016 to 2017, July 16 to July 17, Texas gained right at about 400,000 people in population. 
The year before was 440. The year before that was 500,000. So in three years, we gained almost a million and a half people in population. Okay? Uh, Dallas-Fort Worth alone added 125,000. That was the only metropolitan area in the country that gained over 100,000 people in one year. That's a good-sized town. 125,000 people is a good-sized town. But that was what was added to the Metroplex. Austin gained about 55,000 people. Incidentally, Austin became now is bigger than Cleveland, Ohio, as an MSA. I don't know why that's important. I just thought you'd like to know it. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> You're not going to get any brownie points for it. But uh, uh, anyway, there it is. Maybe we'll get LeBron James to come here. I don't, uh, yeah. Maybe we don't want him to come here. I don't know. <laughs> But but you can but you can see how it's how it's doing. The 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 state I mean here the top fifteen counties last year in growth, eight of the fifteen were in Texas. Yeah, Maricopa County, that's Phoenix. That was the number one. But then you get Harris, Tarrant, Bayer, Dallas, Denton, Collin, Fort Ben, Travis. I mean, there you are. Travis County alone is the fifteenth uh this is just number count. This is not percentage. This is just numbers. Yeah, yeah, it's numbers. Because Number. in real estate, what counts more? Percentage rate of growth or number of people? Most of us think in terms of number of people. And we can convert that to households, and then we, that converts to housing demand, and, and we, we're, we're, we're in good shape with that. Here's, uh, this is where uh, last year people who moved here from another state, domestic migration, where did they go in Texas? Which counties? Did they go to? And again, that I-35 corridor is a, is a major mecca. And Travis and Williamson County, right in here, central Texas, is one of the major meccas for, for the domestic migration. And this is from 2000. This is for the last seven years, eight years, collectively. Uh, uh, we always talk about people moving here from other states and from other countries. And that where are they going is a big issue, and you can see how it dominates there. And you can see how Austin, net, uh, uh, natural increase was about 8.1%. This is the number of people per thousand, but it, it converts to a percentage. Uh, you know, about 8.1% uh, natural increase, about four, international migration is not as big to Austin as it is to some of the other areas, okay? Not that you don't get any, but it's it's there. But look at that huge net domestic migration there on the bottom of the chart, on the bottom of the bar uh, coming to Austin. So that's that high-tech growth, okay? I mean, quite frankly, we are building the wall on the wrong river. <laughs> We've cut off our labor supply. Why do you think we can't build houses? We don't have any labor coming up from... South and Central America and Mexico. We needed to build the river on the Pecos and the Red River and keep out the Yankees and the Californians. Now then, <laughs> nah, nah, nah. See, you guys shouldn't like that because you've been benefiting from all those damn Californians. I'm sorry, some of you are probably from California. <laughs> So, so it's coming, and that's that, that's that level of in migration that's happening and that, that ballooning up of the, of the, of the local population. Here's the, here's the growth projections in, in 70 to 40. Yeah, you've seen this. Yeah, I've given you this slide before. We gained about 14 million people the last 40 years. I'm using 2010, the census year, as my split, my drop off. From 2010 to 2050, we're going to gain between 22 and 30 million people. In Texas, in Texas. Now, obviously, that's at the best scenario. That's that red line. The green line is if we do half the rate of change, and the blue line in there is sort of in between uh, the 2010, 2015. It would still be 22 million if we go out and extend that, uh, or or have that rate of growth. So it's it's a heck of a lot of people. They're going to where are they going? The projected population change for the next 40 years. It's the same map. It's the same heat map. They're going to the same counties. They're going to the urban triangle. 
Two-thirds of the population of Texas live in that urban triangle. 87% live east of I-35. So it's a, it's a big kind of thing. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's huge coming. Here's Austin. Here's the Austin MSA. I mean, projected to go from about a million seven in 2010 to over five million people. That's amazing. Three, by 2050. Okay. Almost three and a half million, four million people. Incidentally, at, at three and a half million people, that's 3.2 million more cars and trucks. We run about 0.88 to one. Actually, when I looked at the data, it's been a couple of years ago, within Austin City, it was over one. There was more than one car per person. That's because of the students. They all have two. <laughs> Mom and dad keep paying for the car. But, but uh, I mean, Williamson County, going from about less than a half a million to almost two million people. That's a huge increase. No, a million and a half people going to Williamson County, to Hayes County, going from less than 200,000, 150, to just under a million. I just thought you'd like to see how it breaks out uh, between the, the major, major areas. Uh, let's talk about housing. If you're not aware of it, obviously you probably are. Last year set another record for home sales, for average price, for median price, and 2018 is going to set another record. We're, we're, we're already on the way, and unless, again, some major event or something happens to change it, it isn't likely to change, uh, prices are going to go up. Uh, we're projecting sales that will go up somewhere around the neighborhood of 6.5% and prices to go up about 5%, and that's going to be conservative. But again, that 5% is statewide. Here's what it looked like. Uh, uh, I did a comparative for you. Last 10 years, 2008, which was not really a good base year, right? But 2008 to 2018, where are we today? Uh, Austin, median home price has gone from $192,000 to right just under $320,000, a 65% increase. And you can see how the others stack up. That's a, that's a tremendous rate of increase. Uh, Dallas has, of course, gone up percentage-wise a little more, Fort Worth up a little more. Uh, Austin, Dallas, and Fort Worth have been the bellwethers. It's just really off the, off the chart. Houston and San Antonio are running about the same. But Texas overall was up over 60%. Here's what uh, <coughs> the sales looked like last month. I don't have the June numbers, obviously. We're still in June. Uh, but last month by MSA, can you see it? I know it's a little, little, little uh, faded here. Uh, but you can see the dark green counties. You can only see the, the two red areas, Laredo and McAllen down there uh, on the border. Uh, and then the San Antonio, Austin, Waco, Waco markets are up 1% to 10%, Waco being up a little bit more than that. Not sure what's going on up in Waco. <laughs> well, I mean, generally there's a reason, you know, why sales would pick up more than 10% in a month. And I, I just, I'm not real sure what it was. I know, I know Joanna and, and Chip had a baby. I got a new nephew. I claim them now that they got money. But, uh, but, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, up in the wake up, but that, you know, again, that's, that's this May compared to last May. So that's always a little dangerous. You know, one month this year, the month last, because a lot of things can happen within a given month. Uh, of, of, of sales, but I thought you'd just like to see how the distribution was going around the state. In terms of average prices, what you'll see is very few markets are down. Corpus and Beaumont are down, but that's the uh, Harvey effect, the lingering Harvey effect in both of those markets. The rest of the state is, is pretty much uh, up. Uh, single family building permits, uh, we are projecting actually the permits to do quite well this year. We're expecting uh, uh, single family construction to go up more than 10%. And that's if the builders can find lots and labor. 
And that both of those are now getting to be in short supply. Uh, lots in terms of where they are, what they are, are just being developed in the first place, um, and price. Uh, talk to home builders in any of our major markets. It's almost impossible now anywhere near the central business area are the major market, it's almost impossible to build a house for under $300,000 stick built. They just can't do it. Now, the only exception to that is where they can get density and maybe do condos and go vertical and get a, a lower per unit uh, total cost. I can tell you the townhomes here in Austin are cheaper than single family, which is not telling you something you shouldn't know, but it is. Uh, so you'll find those kinds of things. But the, the construction market is doing, Texas is the world, is the leading home build, it may be the world. Texas is the largest home building state in the union anyway. We build more than anybody else. Uh, Houston and Dallas both built last year more houses than all but four states. Yeah. Uh, so it was, it was, uh, uh, California, Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina, I think, with the four states. Uh, so it's it's been remarkable. Multifamily, you know, uh, the millennials, we talked about the, the good old millennials, but where do 20-somethings live? <laughs> they rent. And we got a lot of 20-somethings, okay? And we got a lot of 30-somethings. The 20 and 30-somethings, I'm kind of lumping those together and calling them the millennials. With me, You with me on that? Okay? And incidentally, they don't like each other. The 30-somethings don't like the 20-somethings and vice versa. And I don't like anybody very much, so <laughs> you got to remember the Kingston Trio for that line. <laughs> anyway, so, so what we've had, the, the demographics have said, okay, we're not going to build as many single families because we've got so many people. The millennials, of course, are numerically a bigger group than the good guys, the boomers. <laughs> I are one. That's the good guys. And, and, and the millennials are a much bigger group. So we got a big group of 20 year olds, a big group of, uh, an even, a, a big group of 30s. We got an even bigger group of 20 year olds. But those 30 year olds now are finally, finally, finally getting married and having kids. Well, they're having kids anyway. <laughs> they may or may not get married. Uh, the biggest increase in, in household count is the two persons living together. Percentage-wise, that's the biggest increase in the in the household counts. Uh, but but that's that's creating the demand for the housing. Now the the multifamily market has it goes it's it goes in cycles, of course, because it's lumpy. Commercial real estate is lumpy. It's not as smooth if if we think of it that way as the residential market. The, the commercial market, because you build an office building, you build an apartment, you build retail space, a million feet, a couple of million feet. What's well, there? Okay, and so you build a few of those, and and you're they're there, and you're stuck with them, and the demand may go up or down, but it so it tends to be lumpy. So we build a bunch in a few years, and then in a few years we don't build as many, and then we build some more, and then we don't build as many. You with me? Some of that is the financing. Some of that is the lenders get nervous. It's, it's overbuilt. Dallas is slacking off. Austin probably slack off a little bit on the multifamily because. The, the lenders, the institutional guys, are getting nervous about whether it's oversupplied or not. It may or may not be. They just get nervous about it. And when they get nervous, they're a little slower putting the money out for it, either debt or equity. And, and so we're finding some of that going on. We have developed at the center, uh, this is one of these other things that we can do now that we haven't been able to do heretofore, what we call a residential construction leading and coincident index. The leading index, the one you're probably interested in, that's the red line. <coughs> we, we have developed a, a measure to try to give us some idea of where residential construction is going over the next six months to a year. Uh, it really, it's, it's probably good for about a two-quarter, three-quarter uh, projection. And you can see the red line has kind of been kind of wobbly a little bit. That's another technical economics term, wobbly. Uh, but, and, but the blue line are the residential permits, and we're doing, we're doing okay. It, uh, it, it took, a, took the, the big dip up there was really Harvey. That was, uh, we had a dip that, that, that hit the economy, uh, from Harvey. Austin housing market. Here's what we have to look forward to. (laughs) 
For those of you who were at the TAR meetings last winter, I used that slide uh, in front of the board, and, but the guy who spoke right in front of me was a VP from NAR from San Francisco. <laughs> and he happened to be sitting next to me. <laughs> we were on the, so he got, I, I came back after I, got, I, I leaned over to him. I said, hey, I hope I didn't embarrass you with that slide. And he says, I know, the only problem with it is too low. <laughs> he said, everything I'm dealing with now is two million and three million. Yeah. So, I mean, is this really something we have to look forward to or not? I don't know, but, but that, that is one of those things. Again, Austin, just like the state, last year, record year, this year, another record year. I mean, it, it's still going and blowing, right? You're all sitting here waiting for me to shut up so you can go sell another house. Uh, we're, we're projecting about a six, six and a half percent, uh, rate of increase in Austin. So far, year to date numbers through May, uh, are, it's up six percent. So our six and a half percent projection is not too far bad. Uh, boy, if we can get that close with everything, we're, we're ecstatic. Uh, so we're looking, I keep hitting the wrong button. Sorry about that. Here's what it looks like on a monthly basis for those of you who've never seen what the pace looks like monthly. And you can see it's real close. The years, the differential is not much. But what you can tell is the black line, which is this year, is above the green line, which was last year, which, okay, you're going to sell more houses this year than you did last year. And at least on a month-to-month -month basis so far, it's, it keeps going. This is the selling season. It starts, what, in March? goes through July, August. Okay, uh, I mean, that's, you can just see the season now. You can see the hump in the, in the chart there. Uh, and it, and it go, it's always interesting to me why December picks up. But every year it's that way. December picks up from November. And you would think it would be the other way around because most people, the Christmas is a week uh, where people sometimes, but they have the week off, I guess, so they can go out and go see houses and stuff. But anyway, it does. I can tell you statistically it does, and we'll see how it goes. Here's what, here's what sales have looked like. This is the multi-county area, and I've tried to label it so you can get a perspective on the map. Again, obviously the green, the green areas, this is by zip code. Okay, this is by zip code. And no, I don't know the zip code boundaries either, but somehow we can get a shape file for that and we can draw a map of it. So you can see that uh, it's interesting down the Lockhart area, the sort of the south, southeast area uh, has been, was down at least in May uh, on a month over month basis for the year. Uh, we don't have the ability yet to do this heat map on a year to date, which would total up all the months. You can see it's been very active in the Mainer area, the Barton Creek area, Dripping Springs and down up towards San Marcos. Georgetown's been good. Uh, and, and you can kind of see it. This again is just percent change in sales. Uh, in terms of Travis County, uh, you can see where it's going just to just focus in a little bit. Uh, uh, the Manor area has been, been hot. Barton Creek, B Cave. Can you see the blue dots? Those are the actual sales. Those are the actual sales. We now can do that. We had, couldn't do that before, but we now get the data. With Geoco, we get a Latin long on every house, home sold, and for that matter, every listing. So we know exactly where they are, and you can kind of see. So again, some of these areas that might be, uh, you know, flat or yellow or down a little bit, it doesn't mean there aren't sales happening up there. It just means percentage-wise relative to the same month the year before. So uh, up in the, um, where is that, Pflugerville? Uh, uh, it, you know, it, it's... Uh, uh, still, still an active market. Lakeway out there is red, but it's, it's got a lot of blue dots in it. Months inventory. This is the story you all know. It's short. <laughs> it's, it's short. Incidentally, uh, Austin of the five major metropolitan areas has a little different, uh, target. Norm, uh, the long-term average months inventory in the Austin MSA is five months, not six. Going back to 1980. So it's, it's five. So we use five here as sort of our indicator of what a balanced market should be. And that's that red box that I drew in there. And I do it plus or minus a month. So somewhere between four and six with five in the middle is, is be considered normal. Okay. 
because we're not that accurate and this, the data aren't that accurate and nothing's that good. So, but you can see where it's down between uh, two and three and especially when it dips down less than two, you ain't got no inventory. That's Aggie speak for it's real tight. Here's what it looked like last year, the, the home sales by price interval to the left, the blue bars. And you can see uh, the, the, the bulk of the market is in that uh, 200 to 500,000, which is no surprise to anybody in here. But look at the month's inventory on the right. This is the current month's inventory as of now. And when you're looking at, for example, in the 150 to 200,000 price bracket with 0 0.8 months inventory, that's a real short, that's a really tight market. That means you just, it's really tough to find. Now, this does include townhomes and condos. So even at that, it's still, they're in there. Okay? It's, it's what we classify as residential, which is single family detached townhome and condominiums. And you can see even even for the million dollar plus, it's a 9.2. At least, well, that's better than the five months, right? But that market generally is a year. When you get down to price intervals and looking at standard what month's inventory ought to be or, or historically has been, uh, you would expect the million dollar plus to be uh, more like about 12 to 13 months inventory, and it's down at nine. So even even that level is 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 down. Median home price, uh, uh, we're projecting it to go up about five and a half percent year to date. It's already up a little over four. July and August will push it up some more. I can tell you that it'll happen. Uh, June, July, and August. We don't have the June data in here yet because this is the selling season. Winter houses most expensive in the summer. Okay, when are they least expensive? In the winter. Okay, and and so you get, but, but these are annual numbers that that uh, come around on a monthly median home price on a 12-month moving average basis. That's this smooths out that curve. Otherwise, it looks real erratic. You can see how it's way above the normal trend, the long-term trend line, and it's still going something like that. Average annual appreciation around here is about five percent, even at that. Austin has been a good housing market for how home price growth or increase uh, for some time. On a price per square foot basis, it's no secret anywhere that Austin is the highest priced housing market in Texas. And here's one piece of evidence of that. The average price per square foot of homes sold is considerably higher here in the Austin area uh, than, than for Texas, uh, at large. It's, it's, you know, you can see if you extend visually that, that green trend line. Can you see the green trend line in there? Just let your eye kind of extend. It's, it's approaching the $200 a foot. It's not there. Maybe a few years to get there, but, but it's getting, it's, it's moving in that direction, uh, rapidly. Uh, year over year percent change in average price per square foot blah 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 got blah, 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 got to explain what the graph shows uh again for the MSA uh you see uh, it's interesting look at that Bastrop area but that's been a low price market over there for some time for those of you who work the, the Bastrop area uh east of I35 has always been the lower priced homes right West, I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. I, I love telling you the intuitively obvious. So, so you can see how that, that pattern uh, has continued. In Travis County, again, I, I, I've done the sales for you, but you can see how uh, that home price per square foot, by and large, is still, it's, it's up. It's just a matter of degree of up. There's only that one small red zip code up there on the northwest side, northeast side of the county. I'm not sure what that is up there. Some of you may know better than I. Uh, but everywhere else is doing uh, pretty well. It's interesting when we look at the price distribution of home sales in Texas, in uh, Austin, 2011, roughly two thirds of the homes sold were under 250,000 and one third were over. 250,000. By 2018, or 2017 actually, 
The, the, it reversed. It's about a third of the homes being sold are under 250 and two thirds are over 250. Just completely flip flopped in a relatively short period of time. In a relatively short period of time. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier. We can't build new ones at the, at the lower price point. Remember a few years ago, it was nothing to go out and see new home subdivisions starting at 110, starting at 120. You see that much anymore? Ah, uh, ah. Uh, you just, they just can't do it. The land cost alone, the land cost alone dictates you can't do it. I mean, if you're going to build a house for $150,000, you got to have a lot cost that's under 40. And even that is a stretch. Williamson County uh, has been real active, as you all know, up in the Georgetown area and up through there. Current month's inventory is two and a half or 2.6. <coughs> you can see on an annual basis the home sales going up. Uh, I'm not, I gave you the year-to-date number for 2018, but it's hard to get a perspective of what that means. But, but percentage-wise, year-to-date this year compared to year-to-date 17, you with me? Okay, it's up about 7%. So if it continues that trend, uh, you know, uh, it would be up again another 7% uh, for the whole year. Median home price uh, approaching $281,000. That was the May. Uh, that's the year-to-date median price in Williamson County. And you can see how it's gone. I mean, just a few years ago, it was under $200,000. And now it's approaching 300000 and it didn't take long to get there. Uh, here's what the distribution of sales in Williamson County looked like, uh, at least in terms of the increase of May of this year to May of last year. And again, with the, with the blue dots are the actual sales. You can see how the Georgetown area has been leading. Leander is flat, Cedar Park and Round Rock off a little bit, uh, out toward Taylor and so forth. Uh, was was down a little bit. I'm not sure why. You would think there would have been more activity because that's where some of the lower-priced homes can be found out in that direction. And again, price per square foot, uh, it, it's almost up everywhere. The, the, the home prices continue to kind of go up. Uh, Georgetown down a little bit. That's a sales activity, but we'll see about that. Hayes County doing the same kind of thing. Hayes County hadn't, hadn't had the, the kind of oomph yet. I don't know exactly. Some of the problem down there is, is availability of lots. I know in the San Marcos area, uh, uh, lot development is an issue. Land availability, uh, getting into the hills and so forth where you can develop, but it's up 7%. For the year, current month's inventory is uh, 3.1, which is, again, very low. But it's been, it, you know, sales levels almost doubled since 2011. It's still been a good market and a growing and developing market. Uh, that whole area down through there, uh, and then it, I know it bumps into New Braunfels. I think New Braunfels is actually in the next county, isn't it? New Braunfels not in Hayes. It's, it's in uh, Kamal. Uh, excuse me? Kyle and Buda are down there, uh, and those areas have been very active uh, and very attractive for people uh, uh, coming uh, over into the central Texas area. Median home price, not quite as expensive. Some of the little bit less expensive properties down in Hayes County. So if you go south instead of north, price differential uh, is, is somewhat noticeable. Uh, I, I don't know how long that's going to pertain because – I can tell you that's a pretty area down there. That's that's nice property uh, uh, down there. Uh, and here it is here. If you want to just see the the, the kind of uh, uh, sales distribution, uh, at least this year, this May, you can still have, see how the sales tend to concentrate right up pretty close to I-35, relatively speaking, just up out by uh, Wimberley. And then, of course, out toward Dripping Springs has really picked up. Uh, you get more a little more land area uh, out there, but more expensive. Uh, out there as well. And then in terms of uh, prices, it's interesting. I said more expensive. Uh, I'm not sure Wimberley has gotten over the floods yet. I, I talked to some people out there, but it's been some months ago. Uh, you remember they had the flood, what, about two years ago? Was it two? Has it been three? Two or three? 
maybe more, th more like three years, but, but uh, uh, they, they had some problems out there, I know. And Dripping Springs uh, kind of goes up and down. Uh, but, and again, this is just this May compared to last May, and so who knows what that will look like. So what does your crystal ball say? I'm going to finally shut up. I do appreciate you having me, and I appreciate your patience with me. Uh, they asked me to cover the waterfront, so I did. Uh, and, and we'll see how it goes. I, I'll, I'm happy to answer some questions. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to let you get out of here a little earlier. Yes, sir. Labor, tariffs, what kind of other impacts are you noticing? Yeah, the question is labor and tariffs and what other impacts or things that we might be looking at. Uh, obviously, what's going on with the tariffs and the, and the import-export uh, uh, issues, uh, NAFTA particularly. NAFTA is important to Texas. Texas is the number one exporting state in the union. Uh -huh. Yeah, you don't even know it, but we are the leading state in the union for the value of dollars of exports. Petrochemicals and oil and gas. Those are the, those are the biggies. Those are the biggies. So, so, uh, maybe more than anything else, the NAFTA. Is, is, is one of those things out there. The general belief among the economists is that they won't screw it up too badly. But I mean, we know we're dealing with politicians, uh, but hopefully they won't screw it up uh, too badly. Labor is an issue. I, I made the joking reference to the wall on the wrong river, uh, but it is an issue, and it's a very big, noticeable issue here in Texas. You go ask any of the home builders that you deal with, Okay, what are their issues that they're looking at? Lots and labor. It's a double L. Okay, I can't find the lots. I can't find them priced like I'd like to have them, or I can't find them at all. But I'm especially having trouble with labor. Ask a home builder today. Most of you who've been in the business for a, for a few years know that you used to tell your clients if they wanted to build a new house, if they started today, they could probably have the house finished in about five months. If you're talking to them today, you better tell them 10, 11, or 12. And part of that is labor. And it's it's like the framers. You can't get a crew of nine or ten guys out framing. You get a crew of two or three. Well, just common sense tells you they can't build it as fast. And and it is. It's, it's slowing down. Try to get concrete poured. Uh, uh, <laughs> Finding a guy who will drive a concrete delivery truck is a problem because they can go and work in the energy patch and make 120 grand a year compared to making 35 grand a year driving a cement truck around town. And that's assuming they can pass the drug test and the criminal background test. 16% can't pass the test. I'm sorry. But they'd have to go live in Midland. Okay, well, for 120 grand a year, 140 grand a year for a couple of years, I'll go live in Midland. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What's happening to the length of time that it's taking to get new subdivisions online, development time with local restrictions, yeah. like VK, for example, or, or, and uh, concerns about water availability and density and water quality? Oh, boy, you just telling me a bunch of stuff. Uh, to try and repeat. Uh, what is the effect of, of, of time delay in getting new developments permitted, platted, and, and up and going, right? right? Okay, and then you said something about water availability. And especially in outlying areas, okay. The whole regulatory issue uh, of the permitting and the plan has added to the cost of developing a lot, okay? And it's not just a direct cost, like an impact fee which is a direct cost, you gotta pay so much. But that time delay, I mean, if it used to take six months or 12 months maybe to, to get a permit and a plat uh, uh, approved and where you're ready for improvement and development and in vertical construction, today it may take two, three, four years. In California, it might take eight, nine, 10, 12 years. Because we don't even have all the stuff they have to do. Do you have to do an environmental impact study? Maybe. Maybe. There it's universal. It's, it's yes. <laughs> but I know. And the, 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 all of this stuff, anytime you add a regulation, it adds the cost. 
Every regulation adds a cost, either a direct cost or an indirect cost in terms of time. The other thing we discovered, we, we looked at some of these issues. We discovered it back in 07, 08, 09, and 10 when a lot of people were laid off, particularly by cities and counties. They haven't been brought back. So now the zoning the, uh, board the, uh, staff, the planning staff, and so forth, they just don't even have the personnel to do the job. And, of course, some of the ones they left off were the people who knew what they were doing. And so, uh, you know, because uh, they were the highest paid. So you let go of the highest paid. Now, you also asked uh, water. Water's a terrific issue. Uh, I, mean, it's, it, I mean, it's a real problem. And, and if, if something could start interfering with the rate of growth of the entire central Texas area, water availability is going to be one of those issues. It's going to be a big deal. Uh, and it's interesting because we've actually got water in Texas. Number one, it's brackish. And number two, it isn't always where we want it to be. So, but we're really good with pipelines. I mean, one thing Texans know how to do is build a friggin' tight pipeline. We got them everywhere. They're everywhere. You can't drill anywhere in Texas and not hit a pipeline going some, from here to there or someplace. So you would think we could, mobile, you know, transport water uh, accordingly and do, and do that thing. So water's going to be a, main, a big issue. And I don't have a magic pill answer for that one either. Uh, the, the, the aquifers are, are running low. If we run droughts, they're not being replenished, and and that's going to be an issue. And you made a third, a third, whatever it was. Yeah. Do you know when the LCRA uh, charter expired? I have no idea. I, I don't keep track of those things that closely. I don't know when the LCRA charter expires. I don't know. Sir? If it was in your power, what would you do to make Austin more affordable? Pay me a lot of money. <laughs> If it was in my power, <laughs> you started the question. No. Uh, it, it was interesting. Well, I told you that we worked with the ABOR, with the staff here at ABOR, uh, when they were looking at the, what was the name of it? Uh, uh, Code Next. And, and affordable housing was a big part of that. And, and we were putting data together, but we, we got to answering, how would you make affordable? Because it was interesting, the Code Next, we, we did an analysis of where they wanted to, the city planners uh, or the city department wanted to put affordable housing. Guess where they wanted to put it? Right where the most expensive land was. Okay? So our answer was, if that's where you want affordable housing, you're going to have to buy the land and give it to a developer or develop it yourself. Now, if you want the city to be in the housing business, good luck. Uh, but because it just it just makes sense. Uh, the other thing there's they they've gone to more of the inclusionary type zoning. Miller uh, Airport area, uh, whatever that development up there. Uh, I, they have a mandatory affordable uh, you know below market uh, rent and price number of units, and it has to be in perpetuity. Uh, it's uh, uh, that's one of the things around the country where they have that kind of zoning ordinance. Sometimes it's the initial development has to have the affordable housing, but once it's resold or relet, then the, the 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 limits go off. Well, here, at least as my understanding for that particular development, that's not the case. So they've done a trust and a foundation, which again is another approach. The city may have to go into a trust or foundation with some private or or philanthropic uh, groups and create a, 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 an entity that has the financial capacity to build the affordable housing and take the, take the hit on it, okay? Uh, I, I did years ago some work with the city of Houston. We were looking at land that they took back on tax foreclosures. Turn those lots around, because they're not on the tax roll. You're losing money on them. Turn them around and make them available at such a low cost, and, and the proviso is, you will build a home or, a, or build rentals that are at, pr at these price levels or at this rent level, which would be in the affordability range. And again, that's where the city has to take the hit because the state law required them to have to sell the lot and collect the back taxes. Well, nobody in their right mind is going to pay them the back taxes. So the lots just sit empty for years. Okay, So there are some things that can be done. 
Uh, it is very difficult, almost now to impossible, for just private developers, even the altruistic ones, even the guys who are in the uh, low-income and affordable housing business. It is extremely difficult. They can't make a profit. So they've got to figure out who can absorb the loss. I mean, it, the, the business part of it is just that simple. And I wish I had a better answer. Okay, I think we're about done. I appreciate it very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day in the year. Thank you, My pleasure.